name is Imre Goldberg. I'm going to be talking about optimization. It's called optimizing latency. It's actually optimizing search. I called it optimizing latency because it was not under load, but actually making one search request faster and getting latency. I decided to give a short version of you know, the TLDR of what I'm going to talk about. So apparently, even if you go by the standard tips of how to do Python optimization, there's a lot to do beyond just those standard tips. A lot of it, uh, at least for my kind of uh, application when, where I do a lot of I.O., is just using the DB in a smarter fashion, trying to avoid doing stuff. And the stuff that you do, trying to make it uh, fa as fast as you can. As part of this talk, I'm uh, one of the tools that I used for a measurement that we developed. I'm releasing it. And I think that any optimization talk should have this quote. And if you don't, aren't familiar with it, then there you go. Uh, there are only two hard things in computer science, cache invalidation and naming things. Um, and I ran into it multiple times. And I think that any talk that deals with optimization should have that quote in it. I used to be the CTO of Desti. Today, I'm the VP R&D of Symmetria. Desti was a, a travel search iPad application. And we did a lot of uh, natural language uh, based search. That was our input. Our search actually worked with our in internal API. The iPad application would pr provide the natural language input into our backend services, which was hosted on AWS. Initially, search was fast enough, useful. But as we added more content, I mean, we grew from just supporting North California to supporting all of the United States. Search became slow and then became really slow. Our first solution was, hey, let's just do some working around it with uh, just ch changing the user experience. But there is only so much you can do with adding a progress bar. Let's define the problem a bit more clearly. What you see in front of you is the pipeline of from getting a user input and showing the results. So the first stage is where we would you know, get text and parse it, um, turn it into entities and get a structured query out of it. Then we would query the database for candidates, for results. Uh, just to clarify, our search was get as input a text string and get as output what we would call POIs, points of interest, which might be hotels, restaurants, attractions, or whatever else as a tourist you would expect to see you know, when you go on a trip. So we would get candidates from the database. We, in memory, we would uh, score, then rank the candidates. Once we have the uh, 10, 20, 50, whatever uh, results that we wanted, we would render them, essentially add all the additional information that is needed in order to display them to the user, such as images or uh, snippets that the user would like to see in order to be convinced that those results are relevant, and then log those results. All the steps re would require the ontology. On the ontology is this um, structure that would encapsulate all the knowledge that we have on the search domain. For example, this is an example that I would repeat. Let's say that I'm looking for family-friendly hotels. Essentially, I'm traveling with my child. Then if this hotel has a baby cot or if they have babysitting services, then that would make it family-friendly. And this implication was something that we would store in the ontology. Just knowing that the phrase um, baby bed or cot and so on uh, are alternate names for, uh, for this uh, entity, baby bed or cot, um, this would also be stored in the ontology. Now, once we progressed enough, everything became relatively slow. And every once in a while, things would be much, 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 much slower. And it was unclear as to why, except that you know, we had to optimize stuff. And before we start, our stack was uh, Python, Django, and Postgres. Going by the book, doing standard Python optimization. Uh, actually, a few years back, I gave a presentation on, about that on uh, PyWeb IL. You need to have good unit tests. You need to use profiling and then you know, optimize the slowest element. And this was just not good enough. Uh, profiling, the standard profiler, wasn't giving us enough information. The kind of improvements that we had to do were not just you know, getting this function and improving it and finding, hey, we are doing something really wasteful in this bit of Python code, which you know, might happen, but wasn't 
where the problem was we had to do actual architectural changes and those are very costly, which means that we wanted to be sure that we're doing the right thing before we embark on I don't know, changing the database architecture or adding this specific type of cache. I needed a better tool for doing uh, measurements and knowing what was slow. So we developed the tool. The requirements, what I wanted to achieve was to measure uh, the high level phases of the search. So if you're familiar with uh, profile output, it gives you all the f function level uh, all the functions being run as part of the uh, as part of the code that you run that were, was profiled, and instead of that, I wanted just to profile in very select points, a few points, and know how much time did this take, how much time did this take. I wanted to cover all the phases of search, and some code blocks would be nested. I mean, I wanted to know how much did the overall rendering take, but maybe I wanted a specific part of the rendering, say, getting the photos, how much would this, this part take? So I could say, hey, pho getting photos took, say, 200 milliseconds out of 400 milliseconds for uh, rendering POIs. Another thing that I wanted to do is that I wanted to do these measurements on production, on live user data, because getting profile to run on production was really scary and not really practical for us. Profile one is much slower than standard, uh, standard Python code. I wanted the results not to be aggregate, which is what Profile does. I wanted the full data set of results, in some, mostly because I wanted to look at each row and be able to analyze it, each specific uh, search, uh, search that was slow. And also, in some cases, a search was affected by the search that ran before it. So I wanted the whole data set. So I developed this uh, short piece of code called uh, Code Timer, which you can see an example here. And I, uh, this is somewhat real example from our actual code. But uh, of course, I cut out a lot of it just to make it clear. And you could use it as a decorator. You could use it as a context, ma context manager saying, OK, this code will be as part of the uh, parsing phase. Initially, you could also say begin recording and end recording for a specific part. Um, less useful, but useful uh, sometimes in, in rare cases, once you have the decorator and the using with, very useful, very easy to use. Even if it's a loop, you have uh, a bit of control saying, hey, I want if this bit of code repeats in a loop in the, same, in the context of the same uh, search, you may want it uh, aggregated or you may not, and you can control this kind of behavior. This is actually an extract from an actual results that I have. Normally, what you would expect is to see the uh, column headers saying, OK, the top level took this much, and the search main took this amount of time. Because of the way that the uh, code timer behaves, uh, in some cases, the uh, the columns would be would change. Getting the, this way would make sure that there would, would be no confusion in, in in the information. And by the way, you see those numbers, though that's uh, 2.8 over there. Those are actual search numbers, which translates to really not good, really needs optimization. Also, it's nested. So how would you use this kind of thing? You, I would get it as a CSV file format. So the first thing I would do is, in case the the columns were not aligned, I would align them. And then I would, you know, it's Excel, I would go at an average and a median. That's the point where I would start to look, where are the problems? So the first thing I would look for uh, uh, columns that have very high median. These are columns that almost, almost always are slow. Then I would look for columns that have high average. These are columns that in some cases are slow. And then I would look for cells that have high values. And those are, you know, the process itself might be OK, but in some specific search queries, this particular user asking this particular uh, search query would have uh, slow experience. So that's how you would go you know, saying x percent of the cases, this area is slow. Now I'm going to go over the, the solutions. And again, this is after exhausting the simple optimization methods. So I'm now considering, you know, redesigning and so on, the, the more complex things. If you want to go over simple ways, you know, Google is your friend also, you can go through my presentation. Like the straightforward exam uh, examples or um, methodology on how to optimize 
readily available. So to give you an example, I would search for family-friendly hotels. And the example I gave before, it's family-friendly if they have babysitting services or a kitchenette in the room or a baby bed. And this kind of implication, we would compute it in, in runtime. And initially, that was perfectly fine. The more POIs in our database, it wasn't that efficient. So of course, you want to move this kind of calculation offline and be able to tell, hey, this is family friendly to this level. So moving, to this, uh, moving this calculation offline possible took, uh, I think, a few days of work. The main problem is that suddenly um, other things in, this, in the system start to behave differently. Suddenly, you need to schedule batch processing, and suddenly, um, the content manager who was used to you know, changing the way that uh, babysitting services would affect family-friendly would just make a change, run, run his search, and immediately see the results. And now we would have to wait for the batch processing, the batch update to finish before we would be able to see the results. But it was worth it. The system was significantly faster. Still not fast enough, but faster. You know, If you have a problem sometimes and you don't have a lot of time, as in calendar time, Sometimes the best solution is just throwing money at it. And this is the easy database optimizations. Um, by the way, we hired a DBA consultant to do that. I'm not a database expert myself. Apparently, everything that touched our DB was slow. So the obvious thing to do, I took a, lo took a look at the log of all the queries that were run as part of a, um, of a single uh, search. And apparently, we had more than 100 queries. So cutting down that number. Um, an easy way to cut down that number, by the way, is if you have a certain objects that you would uh, query the database for initially, and then you would query them again and again and again. For example, constants that you store in the database, just querying for them one time would you know, make things much, much faster, even though the query was very fast. Doing it a lot, accessing doing this IO thing was very slow. After we did that, of course, hey, let's throw money at the problem, as I said, and moving the database large instance size, hard disk becomes SSD, as much RAM as you can squeeze, and suddenly everything is much faster. Even if you're not, even if your database is not indexed, but going over a lot of elements that reside in memory is much faster than getting them from the hard drive. So that was a significant improvement. Another thing that we did, um, apparently, let's say that the whole POI table was in memory, which is great, but then some user would change, would store a POI to his travel itinerary or something like that, and suddenly this ta your table was you know, no longer in memory because some other table was deemed to be more important, which is kind of unfortunate. So what you want to do is you set up a read replicate, and you direct all search queries to the read replicate, uh, sometimes it's called a slave instance or master slave, and and that way, within the read replicate, the, uh, this table is uh, is always in memory, which makes makes things much faster, and you know the table never never leaves the memory. Very nice. Um, the price you have to pay for that, by the way, apart from the money for the additional database, is that suddenly you have to wait the additional time for the read replicate to update, which might be a lot, might be not. The next thing you, you want to do is you want to index your data. I mean, it's kind, kind of obvious everyone does. Yes, does the DB index on the Django columns, and hey, the database is optimized, until you actually need to you know, get things to run faster, and then you look at your SQL, and it's not really indexed. The database is ignoring your indexes. So what do you do then? You run your SQL, you, do, uh, you run it once. First, you need to log it to, to be able to actually know what was run. Then you run it with explain. You don't have to do the next step, but I did it. Uh, our DBA recommended we did. And then you find all the places where the database is actually using wasteful loops instead of index lookups, and you fix those. You add the right indexes. If you, have, if you discover that you're using uh, several columns, you know, which specific index of multiple columns you need to add. So that's the way to look at, you know, to add indexes correctly. Again, if you were to try to add those indexes right from the start, you would probably not do the right thing, 
because that would be premature optimization. Right from the start, you don't know how your search query would, would look because it evolved. It would evolve. The next thing, and that's something that's kind of not obvious, you can store things in memory, as in global memory or as a, or as a singleton. Um, specific kind of things, we had the, the, the ontology, for example. We loaded we lo uh, all of it into memory, which worked well, uh, but loading it to memory took uh, between uh, a tenth of a second to a second, which is pretty slow doing it for each query. So if you just loading it to memory and keeping it there in some variable, singleton, whatever, makes it that much faster. The problem, the, the, the price that you have to pay is that now you need to refresh it. And if you have multiple processes or multiple servers, then refreshing it becomes kind of more complex if you change the ontology on one server and now you want to tell this, this other server, hey, please reload the ontology. So you can make it you know, add a time to live and make sure that every 10 minutes it is updated. Um, you can add another thing, regardless of, uh, of in-memory caching, you, you, should, you should add probably, or consider adding caching, memcached. We use the Elastic Cache, which is AWS uh, memcached as a service, I guess. We also used it to maintain the version of you know, the data that we kept in memory. What would you use for in-memory and what would you use here? So if you have a very large object, say a couple of megs, that doesn't go well with memcached, which holds smaller documents. Um, if you have many small key value pairs, that's great for memcached. It makes a lot of sense. And we had those. So remember those properties I mentioned earlier, the results of the pre-calculation, knowing that a certain POI was family friendly, remembering that it's family friendly to a level of, say, 0 0.8. So that was kept in, in the cache. Um, the photos, you know, um, might be kept in the database uh, later on, or maybe the URLs for the photos might be kept in the cache, depending on how many photos do you have. Maybe you just want to display the first one. That makes a lot of sense to keep it in the cache. Every time I mention cache, I mention the price you have to pay on how to make sure you maintain it well. This goes back to cache invalidation. Um, for memcached, you need to use uh, versioning. Uh, Memcached and Python and Django have uh, good mechanisms for that, but you need an approach. Um, if you actually run into problems there, you know, give me a call, drop me a line, and I would be happy to discuss it with you. So apparently, we wanted to log everything in order to do analytics, but saving stuff to the database takes a lot of time. And that's unfortunate, because the user doesn't care about what you store to the database. The user cares about getting his results as fast as you can provide them. So what would be nice is that as soon as you have the results, you know, just send them to the user and do and save you know, the results to the database on your own time, not get, let the users wait for that. So because our server wasn't under a lot of load, the easiest solution would be to just start a thread, do this work in a different thread, and as soon as you start that thread off, just return the results for the user. Of course, if you have a server that is under a very high load, that will not work very well. So you probably need to set up worker threads and, uh, and the queue. And in different circumstances, you maybe want some a solution that is a bit more involved. Um, we discovered that even the database was not fast enough. I mean, we got the system to work pretty nicely. Everything was under one second, and we wanted to go even faster. And then we started to use AWS Cloud Search, within it, which is an indexing service. Uh, similar to Lucene, it actually supports a, Lucene syntax, instead of querying the database, which was almost always the slowest part of our uh, search pipeline, we just would query cloud, cloud search. Now, again, this came with a price. Suddenly, you have to do batch processing of updating cloud search, which would also cost money. And you need to analyze, you need to design a process for doing that. Also, the technical process on when that would be. Uh, updated, but also the human process of how content editing now looks, because now you have to wait, say, a day, a couple of days, until your documents, in our case, points of interest, would be updated. We managed to optimize search from multiple seconds, as you've seen, to under one second. Usually it was much faster. Actually, yesterday, it was the first uh, piece of code that I put on GitHub. Before that, all, all my code is, was on my blog. Um, so this code is available for you guys. Um, and special thanks go to 
Uh, this guy here, Nitsan Shaked, was a consultant for optimization that we brought along. David and Sachi were two guys that work, the two developers that work with me, and Adav, our CEO, which told me, hey, this is a very big problem. Maybe you should get a consultant and not try to solve it all on your own. It, the question was uh, that I mentioned that I could turn it on and off in production and whether or not the code timer class supports it. So the code timer class itself does not support it, but our uh, uh, server infrastructure does, the infrastructure that we worked for Django. So we specifically wrote uh, what we call the feature flags that were kept in, in the database. By the way, also cached, um, non-trivial non caching project. Uh, but, but yes, we could turn them on and off, and it would you know, say whether or not you should use a code timer or maybe a code timer dummy. Uh, thank you all. I'm Imre Goldberg.